Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kyle Ferrier, the Director of Academic Affairs and Research here at KEI. Today's program is part of our academic paper series. Um, before we get started on uh, the program, I just wanted to uh, highlight another one of our latest additions to the academic paper series, which we didn't have a program to launch to highlight. Um, this is a paper written by Brian Port. He is the former director of strategy for the United uh, U.S. Forces Korea, United Nations Command and Combined Forces Command uh, in Korea. Uh, and he's just recently written a paper for us on a new analytical framework uh, through which to assess North Korean behavior. It doesn't necessarily um, uh, assess, doesn't necessarily promote a, a single way of of, uh, of how we should address the North Korean issue, but proposes a new way of thinking about how we understand North Korea, which would therefore inform our understanding of, uh, of how we approach North Korea. So it's just as much important uh, but thinking about the methods as much as the ends. Um, but we're not, today's program is not so much looking at uh, North Korea right now, but looking at North Korea a little bit further down the road. Uh, when we talk about economic engagement with North Korea right now, we're mostly talking about, at least in uh, most circles in D.C., talking about inter-Korean economic engagement, Moon Jae-in's plans, Kaesong, Gungang, and beyond uh, of building these special economic zones. But we tend to think about these things a little too statically, and, and uh, our, um, our speaker today is here to talk about how things could be a bit more dynamic if we throw China into the mix and figure out how China and South Korea could... Uh, compete or cooperate, as the title for today's event sort of uh, hints at, in, uh, uh, in moving forward with the special economic zones engagement with North Korea moving forward. So our speaker today comes to us from King's College London. He is a research associate at Project Alpha there in the Department of War Studies. Uh, he recently received last year his PhD uh, from the University of Lyon and the University of Vienna, uh, and much of his PhD research has actually informed uh, uh, the, the paper and the discussion and his presentation, which he will uh, base his, uh, uh, which he will be based off of the paper. So I'll turn things over now to Dr. Uh, uh, Theo Clement, who will uh, uh, talk. We'll uh, have him give a presentation, and then we'll move into Q and A afterwards. So please, uh, Dr. Clement. Hello. Um, well, thank you, thank you very much. My name, uh, as Kyle explained, uh, is Theo Clement. I'm a research associate at King's College London uh, within a research project that's called Project Alpha, uh, where I do mostly uh, research on China, uh, China DPRK economic ties, uh, cross-border economic integration uh, programs. We do a lot of work on sanctions. And uh, my specific focus is actually special economic zones uh, in the DPRK, but also at the border, at the China DPRK uh, border. And that's going to be the, the focus of my presentation today. But before us, before I start, I would like to thank uh, the Korea Economic Institute for their generous support, for their interest in my research, and for the perfect organization uh, for the event. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Irene Park and Ambassador Stevens, of course. Uh, I distinctly remember when I was still a PhD student or even, I think, drafting my PhD proposal, uh, looking on YouTube at uh, Dr. Adam Cathcart doing a presentation of Special Economic Zone, I think, from this very office. So it's a great honor uh, to be here. So my presentation is going to deal with, uh, with Special Economic Zones in the DPRK and special, especially how they might become issues at stake uh, in a potential struggle for economic opportunities between Seoul and Beijing either if sanctions are being lifted in the context of uh, an agreement of, no, of on North Korean uh, denuclearization, uh, or if China decides to more openly break UNSC resolution against North Korea and proceed with a large-scale economic engagement with the North. So as Kyle explained, this research is mostly based on what I've been doing during my PhD, uh, which was dealing with Chinese economic engagement strategy, st strategy strategies towards the DPRK. Uh, mostly doing field research interviews with uh, Chinese businessmen, officials, uh, traders, smugglers uh, involved in the DPRK, but also uh, doing field research to a lesser extent within the DPRK as uh, an invited scholar or as uh, a lecturer at PUST. I think we have people from PUST here, I'm not sure. Uh, 
uh, so the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. Um, so I'm going to take a few minutes to detail special economic zones program in the DPRK, even though it's, it's a topic that's been more and more um, discussed. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more on Chinese, on how Chinese and South Korean economic engagement strategies towards these special economic zones differ. Um, I'll explore the determinants of their potential success beyond uh, North Korean shortcomings in terms of uh, business environment. And last, I'll address in a more prospective manner a uh, conflict and cooperation scenario between uh, between China and South Korea on these North, North Korean special economic zones. Uh, so contrary to a quite widespread opinion, uh, North Korea has quite early uh, in the 1960s um, shown sign of willingness to introduce at least some degree of economic reform. Uh, some of it because uh, policymakers were genuinely, genuinely uh, disappointed with the economic performance of the DPRK. If you look at uh, Kim Il-sung's complete work, you can find some actually quite strong language, uh, language on why uh, there are shortcomings in North Korean economy that are typical to a, a central planned economy. Uh, but also because sometimes foreign partners, including uh, China and sometimes the USSR, were pressing uh, the DPRK to reform its economy. North Korean of economists and officials I've been able to talk to rightfully consider the, the DPRK to be an already industrialized country and thus do not consider China um, to be a model to be followed, which Kim Jong-un, and I don't think we talk enough about that, has been very clear about. If we, uh, we look at the at his speech at the Seventh uh, Party Congress in May 2016. Uh, we don't talk about enough about this quote, uh, despite the filthy wind of bourgeois uh, liberty and reform and openness blowing in our neighborhood, so clearly China. We let the, the spirit of Songun rifles fly and advance according to the path of socialism that we have chosen. So the message towards the Chinese is very strong. We are not interested in your model. However, when, you, when when I address the specific question of special economic zones in the DPRK, it's not unusual to have North Korean official admitting off the record um, that North Korean special economic zones do constitute a foreign policy transfer directly, uh, directly from China. It's actually hardly deniable since North Korea's sudden interest in special economic zones followed uh, Kim Jong-il's visit to China in 1983. Uh, he actually met with, uh, with Deng Xiaoping, and uh, for the anecdote, he also met with uh, Xi Jinping, who is the father of the current uh, leader of China, Xi Jinping. Um, a few months later, in 1984, Kim Il-sung first, me first mentioned the establishment of uh, Rising Sonbong as uh, an open city, uh, a modern international city, uh, which was supposed to uh, cater to uh, foreigners, and it led to the formal opening of Rising Sonbong, uh, Rising Sonbong Free Economic and Trade Zone uh, in 1991. I'm obviously not going to detail all special economic zones that are currently open in the DPRK, but uh, just to give you an idea, these were special economic zones that were open um, in, in 2011. So Rajin Solbong, Kesong, the Mont uh, Gugang, who was suspended uh, after 2008, and we won Wang Pyong. So that's before Kim Jong Un took power, and after Kim Jong Un took power. So as of 2018, you have now uh, 28 special economic zones in the DPRK. Uh, there is a little bit of ambiguity on their exact status and their laws and reform, but I'll come back to that in more in more detail. Uh, while we tend to dismiss all North Korean special economic zones as half-baked attempts at economic reform that are doomed to fail due to the extremely difficult business environment of the DPRK, we fail to capture um, the subtle, subtle, but in my view, at least meaningful evolution of special economic zone programs in uh, North Korea. Because in addition to the spectacular quantitative evolution, I mean the number of special economic zones, uh, we also need to understand that the laws dealing with uh, business and investment in the DPRK have evolved quite dramatically. Uh, the institutional framework is being more and more refined. Uh, their sectorial specialization and their relation with potential foreign investors as well as evolved. And it's quite interesting and revealing, at least in my opinion, because it gives us insights on uh, economic development strategies of the DPRK. For instance, 
special economic zones that were established before Kim Jong-un took power in 2011 were mostly generalist uh, special economic zones that were developed in very close connection with foreign partners. If you look at uh, the special economic zone in uh, Rasson, so in the northeast of the country, I don't have a pointer, do I? No. So here. Yeah. Um, uh, that was developed in very close uh, um, cooperation with the UNDP, with Russia, with China, even with Japan and South Korea, and Mongolia was even involved. Uh, Kaesong, was clear, uh, Kaesong and Mankumgong were clearly um, developed with uh, South Korean backing. And uh, China was involved in the development of that you see here, uh, Wang Gumpyong and WeWa. In sharp contrast, special economic zones uh, that were open after during the Kim Jong Un era are mostly a very unilateral initiative that North Korean pu pure North Korean initiatives, with sometimes some ex post coordination with the Chinese side, and most often have a very specific uh, sectorial focus based on their uh, location. So if you look at the special economic zone that's based in Mampo, for instance, so it's supposed to be here and here. Sorry. I think it's moving forward automatically. Oh, OK. Sorry. I'm not as smart as the TV. Um, so this specialization based on local features might stem from the apparent desire to decentralize to an admittedly, an admittedly limited extent, special economic zone governance in the Libya game. If you look, uh, if you take a look at the at the 2013 law on economic development parks, economic development parks being the North Korean term for special economic zones, uh, it stipulates that provincial and municipal municipal level people's committee must apply to the central guidance authority. Uh, so apply to Pyongyang for the establishment of special economic zones. So instead of uh, Pyongyang decided to develop special economic zone with a foreign partner. It's actually provincial or municipal level committees applying to uh, to Pyongyang to develop special economic zone, and then the coordination is made exposed with uh, foreign partners, which are not involved in the, the design of the project. <clears throat> and this actually explains the overlapping and uh, the lack of general strategy when it comes to special economic zone development in the DPRK. If you take a look at some, I don't have time to go into too much detail, but you can find clusters of, of uh, mutually competing special economic zones trying to uh, attract investment in the same sectors, especially in uh, in, uh, in Sinuiju or near here in uh, in Nampo. I feel like uh, you know a weather forecast presenter. Um, so as you can see on the map, uh, some clusters of mutually competing, uh, competing sorry, uh, special economic zone in North, in North Hamyong province or in Nampo suggest that there is no uh, comprehensive central, central level strategy to develop special economic zones. Uh, if you take a look at, uh, at uh, Dindo and Wodao, so in the, in the Nampo area, you can find that you have three special economic zones that are trying to develop what we call export, export platform FDI strategy. So basically, uh, receiving investment to develop production capacity to export products, mostly to China. But the thing is that you have three special economic zones uh, who are competing against each other to attract uh, on an already extremely limited uh, stream of, of FDI. Uh, the fact that these special economic zones are unilateral initiative with very specific uh, sectorial focus is, however, interesting because Pyongyang could have chosen to develop, to keep developing special economic zones aimed at accelerating already existing trade partner, uh, trade, trade patterns. So basically trying to invest, uh, trying to attract investment in, um, in sectors where the DPRK has, uh, a, um, a comparative advantage. But, um, for instance, by uh, by by um, trying to uh, partner with China, uh, where Chinese companies could outsource production capacities in sectors where there is already uh, which are already lucrative in terms of uh, economic productions, uh, like textile or natural natural resources extraction, mining. You don't find a, spe a special economic zone focus on mining in the DPRK because the North Koreans are, are trying to use a special economic zones program in a very different. Um, in a very different way. Most recent special economic zone aim at attracting investment in much higher value added uh, uh, sectors, such as the processing of uh, raw materials in uh, information technology, in services, or even in high tech 
and research and development. Uh, I don't know if you heard about the special economic zone in Pyongyang called Hunjong High Tech Development Park, which uh, basically encompasses the, um, the North Korean uh, State Academy of Science. So the strategy seems to be aimed at pushing foreign, foreign partners, and especially China, to alter their economic engagement uh, policy towards the DPRK. But in order to better understand that, we need to take a detour and compare how China and South Korea have engaged uh, economically North Korea on the issue of special economic zone and why North Korea has become extremely uh, frustrated from uh, by the Chinese approach. While information on special economic zones in the DPRK is still very scarce, they are widely considered to be as considered as failures. Uh, besides the very mixed results in the Rezin Sonbong, so the oldest special economic zone in the DPRK, if you talk to uh, North Korean officials in Rezin Sonbong, they would say the official uh, statistics that there is 100, 150 foreign companies investing in, uh, in Rezin Sonbong, which is, I don't think it's really credible when you look at what's actually going on on the ground. Um, but the tremendous successes of both Kaesong and Mom Kumgang alone are enough, in my opinion at least, to dismiss the simplistic idea that special economic zone of the DPRK failed uh, only um, because of the unappealing uh, business environment of the DPRK. Of course, there is no denying that North Korea is an extremely difficult uh, place to uh, do business and an extremely risky place to invest. But the monocausal explanation of uh, the business environment is not enough to explain the failure of most uh, special economic zones. Kaesong, for instance, surpassed, uh, when it was closed, uh, surpassed a 3 billion uh, USD in cumulative output in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, uh, while the amount of revenue it generated for the North Korean government has been heavily debated. I, I haven't found any uh, solid estimate on that. The least that can be said from a purely political economic perspective is that Kaesong is an example of a, success, a successful special economic zone program, uh, at least from the North Korean standpoint and from the same point of uh, small and medium companies in, in South Korea. For Pyongyang, uh, Kaesong workers not only generated relate, uh, relative revenue for Pyongyang and for themselves, but also they received on-the-job training, they received training on more advanced machinery and technology, they gained exposure to modern management techniques, and they most likely became key agents in disseminating uh, technological know-how to the rest of the country. And, have been able to engage with a uh, former manager of uh, the Kaesong um, industrial complex. And they told me that we are, they have been trying to move around Kaesong workers within the DPRK in order to disseminate uh, their skills. Um, in such an economic cooperation model, so uh, South Korean investment in the DPRK, um, the DPRK has basically nothing to lose because the, infra the infrastructure is built by Chebols, the energy supplied from the South and the political exposure and the risk that comes with it are minimal. And this South Korean approach uh, comes actually in sharp contrast with uh, China market-centric economic engagement patterns that have been implemented, uh, especially after the, the 1st of July 2002 reforms uh, on, in the DPRK and basically after the arduous march. Uh, China has been relying on small-scale private companies that tend to limit as much as possible their footprint in the DPRK. So they basically trade more than invest in, in North Korea. And the things that they, knew, they barely or do not actually uh, contribute in terms of technology transfer, in terms of infrastructural development in the DPRK, of, or any kind of uh, positive, what we call positive economic spillovers uh, of uh, foreign direct investment that make FDI is so attractive for developing countries. So the strategy of on the Chinese side was dubbed uh, government-led, company-based, market-operated, and mutually beneficial, of course, win-win. And it was intended uh, to familiarize the DPRK with market mechanism and actually pressure it into economic reform if you don't, uh, if you don't change the way you um, create wealth in the DPRK. We don't have an interest in, in investing more because we're, looking, we're, go we're investing in the DPRK to make money. It has had a quite mixed impact on Pyongyang's, on Pyongyang, Pyongyang's economic calculation. Uh, it has allowed, allowed uh, China DPRK trade to uh, surge to a quite unprecedented level. I don't know if you're able to see. Yeah, 
as this table show, but this approach de facto transform uh, North Korea into a supplier of raw and processed resources to China, a quite inferior position that North Korean leaders have uh, specifically tried to avoid uh, since the founding of the country. So if you look at the green, light on, uh, the green line on the graph, so uh, Chinese imports of North Korean mineral and ores, so basically coal and uh, the rest of minerals. When the sanctions were implemented, where uh, the 2270 uh, resolution in 2016 was passed at the UNSC, banning uh, coal imports uh, from China, coal was about 45% of North Korean total exports, which was basically uh, meaning that the DPEC was a, the DPEC was basically a supplier of very raw material, raw unprocessed, very low value added material to the to China, which is exactly what the what the North Koreans have been trying to avoid uh, since the very founding of the country. So this quotation from Kim Il Sung is from the three principles of national reunification, so 19, the 1972 declaration when you explain uh, to uh, South Korean delegates that we've developed a um, relation with a socialist country where we give them raw materials they need only when they give us what we need. And if uh, this principle was not maintained in our economic relations, um, we would have to keep supplying raw materials to them and buying manufactured goods. And that seems very old fashioned socialism thinking, but when you talk to especially North Korean scholars and North Korean officials, they are extremely worried about uh, entering in a pattern of economic subordination towards, towards China. And that's something we don't discuss enough, I think. During one research interview in Silin province, I was able to get access to a trade official position in, um, in Silin. So in the, the, the Chinese province that borders uh, the DPRK. And he, he actually used the word uh, digo uh, imperialism, to describe Chinese economic engagement patterns toward, the, toward North Korea. We should also keep in mind that when Jiang Song Tech, so uh, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un's brother-in-law, uh, was purged in 2013, the KCNA uh, dispatch that announced uh, his execution explained that uh, Jiang was uh, charged uh, with selling coal and other precious underground resources at random and also uh, setting off the land of the Rajin Sonbon economic and trade zone to a foreign country for a period of five decades under the pretext, under the pretext of paying those debts, um, the Russian economic and trade zone, and I mean, the foreign country here being obviously, being obviously uh, China. At that time, Jiang Song Tech was the head of the Joint Steering Committee for Developing China uh, DPRK2 Economic Zone and was widely seen as I don't like the term of Beijing's agents in the DPRK. Um, and the Joint Steering Committee was a cooperation mechanism that was aimed at facilitating uh, Chinese investment, especially economic zone. And it actually was instrumental, instrumental in uh, drafting new um, investment laws in special economic zones in North Korea. If you take a look at the latest version of the Rajin Sonbon, uh, in the Rajin Sonbon trade law, you can find some very, very bold uh, language, at least in North Korean context, reference to international practices, reference to market mechanism within, uh, within the DPRK. So the Chinese policy as this Chinese policy of engagement has failed uh, so far as I uh, know, sorry, the, the North Korean policy of uh, pressuring Chinese to alter their economic uh, engagement policy has failed as large scale uh, state owned companies in China still stay away from the North Korean market and that and that in the context of extreme uh, economic isolation and trade reliance on China, uh, Beijing has actually limit, uh, limited incentives to alter its economic engagement policy towards the DPRK. The fact that economic ties are being piloted by private companies protects Beijing politically, letting trade uh, happen between China and the DPRK, even in the context of uh, sanctions, stabilizes, the, stabilizes North Korea and the direct Chinese uh, periphery. And it actually also offers business opportunities to companies that are based in Northeast China. Um, while the absence of significant investment largely prevents the North Korean economy from developing, which pressures the DPRK into two things. First, denuclearizing, denuclearizing, you need to change in order for us to do more business and reform its economy. 
In this context, it should not come as a surprise that North Korea is uh, openly calling for more self-reliance and less trade dependence on China, as we have seen actually this very morning in uh, in uh, Rodong uh, Sinmun. Um, so in this context, uh, South Korea's ambitions of um, more economic engagement with North Korea could put pressure on China to actually alter its economic engagement uh, strategies toward the North. Pyongyang is actively looking for an alternative trade partner and uh, would definitely prefer a state-to-state -state agreement with South Korea on the relaunching of Kaesong and Mount Kumgang, but also um, develop new discussions with South Korean partners on how to develop more special economic zones, which if you see the, the Pyongyang declaration in 2000. In September 2018, um, South Korea and North Korea agreed on opening discussion for opening new special economic zones. And if you look at the uh, South Korea three belt strategy for economic engagement with the North, they clearly uh, follow most well known special economic zones in the DPRK Rasan, Sinuju, uh, Kaesong, and uh, Mankumgang. Uh, Interestingly, this declaration mentions a new special economic zone, and if uh, Seoul is able to Im implement its ambitious economic engagement program with the North, it would provide Pyongyang with, uh, um, with an, alter an alternative partner to pressure Beijing with, especially since South Korea has political motivation to engage with the North, and is not necessar necessarily looking for short-term financial returns as uh, Chinese companies are. It would thus, it would thus uh, further limit Chinese pressure levels toward the DPRK in a context of extremely tense ties between Beijing and Pyongyang and would definitely hurt uh, Chinese interests in, uh, in the DPRK. A logical way um, for Beijing to cope with the potential opening of a new economic front in uh, the south of the DPRK would be to prepare as much as possible for a quick economic expansion towards the DPRK uh, so that the minute sanctions are lifted or so that the minute there is a green light from, from Beijing, a uh, Chinese company would be in a good position to start uh, engaging with the North. In some way, this has been the, the Chinese strategy for quite several years, creating infrastructure up to the border. There are different uh, economic integration plans, infrastructure, infrastructural development plans that are happening currently in the Dongbei region, so in Northeast China. I don't have time to go all over them, but for instance, uh, what you see in um, in yellow is the Changzi uh, integration program. So trying to link uh, the the interland of the Chinese Dongbei with the DPRK, and this is a strategy that uh, my colleague Christina Kim Chilcotted called economy of anticipation, making the best of a bad situation, waiting for the DPRK to open and reform. Uh, along the Chinese model, uh, while developing infrastructure just up to the border to the DPRK, but without actually seizing business, uh, seizing large-scale business opportunities in uh, in North Korea. Recent events, actually, especially after the the Singapore summit in June 2018, tend to suggest that uh, following uh, the Singapore summit, the business community has entered what I would call a late stage of economy of anticipation actually preparing for economic engagement and sometimes dangerously flirting uh, with sanctions and with red lines. Uh, one example is the opening of the, of the bridge uh, between Tian and Mampo. So what you see here, there is uh, traditionally two, basically two trade hubs with uh, the DPRK. So uh, Yen Bien here and, uh, and Dandong Sinuju. And apparently the Chinese are trying to open a new economic development corridor right at the middle of the right between these two hubs so that's the that's the bridge in june 2018 another also interesting um, element is uh, north korea delegation north korean delegation uh, traveling to china and signing memorandum of understanding on how to develop shipping lanes which are uh, sanctioned by UNSC resolution with uh, the port of Dalian and with the city of Yenta in Shandong province. Or well, a third element, actually the most interesting one, is um, Chinese uh, Chinese proxies for North Korean companies uh, developing a memorandum of understanding uh, to develop more large-scale infrastructure in, uh, in, in the city of Sinuju, so especially uh, a trade and logistic um, base in Sinuju and also more uh, a financial district in Sinuju. It's very unlikely to happen, but we still see uh, Chinese investors being interested in that kind of in that kind of venture. I think this very 
weak dispatch uh, signal uh, may suggest a change of attitude from the Chinese partner. And it would also mean that the DPRK is able to obtain more, uh, uh, what I would say, a more conciliatory attitude from, um, from Beijing, not by reforming its economy, which in Pyongyang mind would be, uh, would lead to a almost de facto neo-colonial neo -colonial relation with, uh, with, with China, but by playing potential partner against each other, just like they did during the, just like they did during the, the Cold War, playing the USSR and China against each other. So it leaves with um, two potential uh, prospective policy options uh, for uh, the international community and for South Korea. Uh, these are respecti respectively based on the premises of uh, Sino-South Korean competition or, uh, or cooperation. So one potential course of action um, would be to try to keep close collaboration between China and the DPRK when engaging with, with the North Korean economy. Um, trying to make investment from both countries, uh, from China and the DPRK, conditional to progress on denuclearization uh, and in order to uh, lessen the risk of being manipulated or being placed, played against each other uh, by the DPRK. It would require extensive coordination between South Korea and China. It would require quite a lot of transparency between Beijing and Seoul. And it's therefore quite unlikely to happen, at least in my, at least in my view and at least in the current Oh, yeah, sorry. You know my PPT more than I do, actually. Um, uh, well, yeah, it's quite unlikely because it will require cooperation and transparency between China and South Korea, which are not really allied when it comes to uh, North Korea, of course. They have widely diverging views. It is therefore uh, extremely uh, unlikely to materialize, given that Seoul actually needs the US approval uh, to lift sanction and to move forward with economic engagement with the DPRK. I mean, Seoul is not Beijing and cannot engage with the North by openly bringing sanctions. But if Seoul and Beijing decide to jointly engage with the North Korean economy, it would therefore require to, for Beijing to actually indirectly coordinate with the US on economic engagement towards the North, which is even more unlikely. What's more likely in my view, however, is that Seoul in Beijing will not be able to work out some kind of cooperative and well thought approach to North Korean economic engagement and will most likely end up competing for influence uh, and business opportunities in the DPRK. It's quite interesting for a political economy point of view because it would lead to some kind of what I would call an upside down um, race to the bottom paradigm <coughs> where developed investing country would be fighting to offer better, better uh, investment conditions in terms of technology transfer in, in terms of infrastructure development to a developing partner in the context of uh, the current stalled discussion and the passive aggressive uh, behavior of the DPRK as shown during the, the May projectile uh, testing campaign. Um, this would suggest, this would definitely, uh, such an approach would definitely appease tension and help pave the way for more constructive dialogue on security issues, which that's for sure. But on the other hand, it would however further convince Pyongyang that it can keep developing its economy uh, by mobilizing its strategic value and its geopolitical capital more than uh, re uh, reforming its, um, its economy. By um, artificially increasing its strategic value and its geopolitical capital in exchange for assistance or friendly engagement policy from South Korea or from, from different uh, economic partners, uh, North Korea would be able to uh, develop its economy, but uh, not by... Uh, doing what the international community is pressuring the DPRK to do, which is uh, reforming its economy. So I think it's a, I think it's a bit a difficult situation because in my view, I'm definitely a pro, pro engagement. I think we should do more uh, economic technical cooperation with the DPRK in order to appease, to appease tension. But we need to keep in mind that if we move forward with economic cooperation with the DPRK, if we lift only a little bit of sanctions, uh, some of the sanctions, we're going to open Pandora's box and having the Chinese blitz creek the North Korean the North Korean market. So I, th I think that's something that we need to to keep in mind. Thank you very much.
you left us with a pretty big conundrum there at the end, um, which I'm sure we'll have opportunity to get into in a little bit in the Q&A. But before I turn things over to the audience, uh, I just wanted to ask a, a couple of questions that I had um, that I sort of thought of while you were, while you were giving your presentation. Um, and from a lot of what you've been talking about, it seems as if uh, uh, a lot of this engagement is being much more thought out on the, the South Korean side in Seoul as opposed to um, what's going on in Beijing. How much thought is really going on in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, once sanctions are lifted, economic engagement with, uh, with North Korea? How much thought is going on with that in Beijing versus how much thought of that is going on on like, the borderlands and what you're, what you're very much interested in and have done a lot of research on? Uh, well, thank you very much for the for the question. It's actually uh, it's actually quite to quite to tell. I mean, reading uh, Beijing's intentions regarding economic cooperation with the North uh, was already difficult before the sanctions. Before the 2016 sanctions were implemented, uh, when I talk with businessmen active at the border or active in the DPRK, they tend to not be really uh, aware that there are sanctions that. There are sanctions that are being actually actively implemented by the by the Chinese side, and they don't know much about the strategic the strategic environment they are in and how does um, their engagement behavior put them at odds with uh, the Beijing policy. You can f have different answer from people at the province at the municipal or the provincial level on the official side. People saying that we do respect sanctions, but we are, China has a very consistent policy of trading with the DPK as, as with any normal country, as long as we don't break sanctions. The thing is that they break sanctions on a daily basis. Last time I was at the, at the DPK border, so that was in June uh, 2018, so one year ago. I've never seen so much trade happening at the China DPK border, not only in Dandong, which, is, which uh, has always been a very connected and lively, lively city, I mean, in terms of interaction with the North. But if you go to Tian, Mampo, uh, Changbai, if you go to Yenbian, the Yenbian um, Korean Autonomous Prefecture of China, you see many, many, many trade, I mean, a lot of trade happening. And the thing is that people who are actually running the trade, either on, at the official or at the, in the private level, have no idea in the, the business environment they're in and the strategic environment they're in. So. That actually kind of accords with something that I, I heard recently that um, uh, people who are smuggling on the border have no idea what the difference between what's illegal and what isn't illegal because they're just smuggling goods back and forth to them. It doesn't really matter. Well, I, I can't, it kind of makes sense. I, I mean, at least from, from their perspective, most of the people who are active at the border did not come from the rest of China to come. They were people who are actually born there. Some of them are uh, Korean Chinese, like Joseon Jok. Uh, but most of them were born in Dandong, have been all their life in Dandong, and they, and they don't see why they should keep doing what people in Dandong have been doing for years because of someone in an office in Washington says that it's not okay to do that. I mean, what's the connection between uh, uh, dealing seafood and the North Korean nuclear program? I mean, it's very hard to have people in Chinese Chinese businessmen being aware of that kind of issues. I had very open discussion with people who were heart dealers. And I had to tell them, well, you know that's according to UNSC resolution, you're actually breaking sanctions, so you are a de facto smuggler. So, okay, yeah, that's sad, but yeah. And the thing is that when we talk about um, counterproductive effect of economic sanction, there is also one aspect that we don't discuss enough. It's the fact that China, uh, the DPRK does not have any alternative trade partner. So it, we, when we sanction the DPRK, we actually give uh, Chinese businessmen uh, quite a lot of leverage on their North Korean partners. I would like to, I would like to trade. I would like to buy North Korean coal, but I'm taking a risk because I'm breaking sanctions. So if I'm breaking sanctions, I, I need you to give me a lower price. It's not reported in statistics. It's cheaper for uh, the Chinese businessmen and gives them an an incentive to do actually more trade with the DPRK. And the North Koreans feel really like strangled economically by the North, so it actually generates even more frustration. I want to take it from the individual level up to uh, the you know, state level, bigger level. Um, and you had talked about uh, SEZs possibly being an avenue through which Pyongyang can play uh, Seoul off of Beijing, like they did in the Cold War with Beijing and Moscow. 
Um, but then you also said that a lot of these SEZs are really determined at the local level and you sort of show the yeah. proliferation they're kind of like eat, cannibalizing each other's markets because they're all competing yeah. for the same the same things so how much leverage are they really to um pyongyang if the SEZs are sort of decentralized in organization is there some limitations um in, in that sense or can they just go back to what they were doing before when it comes to uh, inner workings EF and economic policy making within the DPRK, I have to say that I can catch some glimpses when talking to people, but they are stay, state, I mean, they are clear to engage with me, so I don't get much information. Um, clearly, you can see that some local level, especially people, no, I'm not gonna, it's on the record, right? Yes. Okay. Some people somewhere in the DPRK, in the DPRK can express some frustration, like they would like to develop their own special economic zone, but they don't get the answers they want from Pyongyang. They don't get the, uh, the authorization to move forward with economic uh, integration processes. So it's a bit frustrating. Beyond that, I noticed that um, you have some clusters of special economic zones that are being developed. They are mutually competing against, competing, sorry, against each other for a very limited uh, stream of investments. You can talk to people uh, working on the ground managing special economic zone programs in the DPRK and not knowing that 5, 10, 15 kilometers nearby there is another special economic zone that is doing the, the exact same job and they don't know about that. When I was teaching at Proust, the first, I ob always open my lecture with asking all of my students, where, where are you from? And every time there is one, uh, one of my students who come from uh, a city where there is a special, a special economic zone, I say, okay, what do you, 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 you have in common? Most of, the, most of the time, they've been living like 20 years in a city, and they have no idea that there is a special economic zone where they are. And there's limited information within the DPRK because information flows are really limited. So that's, that's a big issue when it comes to special, special economic zone development. And when we do training, uh, the North Koreans are very keen in having uh, foreigners, uh, Westerners, but Chinese, Vietnamese people doing training in uh, special economic zone development in the DPRK. But the thing is that you can train 15 people, and these 15 people will not never say that they have been trained by foreigners on doing special economic zone, and we don't know if they actively disseminate information within the within the country. So, I wanted before moving to the audience, I want to ask a question to help put this in the context of what's going on in Washington, because Washington hasn't been <coughs> featured in the in, in the presentation so far. Um, uh, based off of you know your research uh, in this and other areas. Um, how do you assess the, the Trump administration's, um, uh, the, the, the desire that, that they keep saying that, that, that Kim Jong-un is looking to radically transform his economy, turn uh, and sort of open up to all of these outside investments uh, that will lead to a magnificent transformation uh, of the economy. How does this fit within uh, that, those comments from the White House and, and others within the administration? Okay, uh, it's my very first time in Washington. Uh, it's getting harder to uh, decrypt what's happening in the US than in the DPRK. Uh, I'm gonna say something positive about Trump. So it's really going to be DPRK focused, all right? I think, the, um, no, but really. Uh, the way the White House and the US administration moved forward for the Singapore summit, I think was a great positive development. I was a bit, I would, no, I was immensely uh, skeptical when I saw the, the infamous video, uh, you know, what, what was the name of the video that was displayed at the, at the Singapore summit? A community of destiny, blah, blah, blah. Basically the, the, the video that was shown to the North Korean delegation uh, presented two different scenarios, war or economic development, which was basically bringing capitalism to the DPRK. That's a non-starter in, in North Korea. There is definitely a will in the DPRK to reform the economy. That's not even open to discussion. You can talk, to, I mean, they don't call it a reform, they call it uh, new economic management measures, but it's an actual reform and you can, you can discuss it with anyone in the DPRK, even top level. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the DPRK wants to become a capitalist country. That doesn't mean that the DPRK wants to become China, and they clearly do not want to become China. I've heard it from so many people. Within the DPRK, but also Chinese 
uh, scholars who engage on a monthly or yearly basis with their colleagues and they are clearly being told by the North Korean counterparts, we are not interested in your model. That's not something we want to follow. Um, I think the, I think the approach that uh, the engagement approach, like talking to Kim, uh, to, uh, talking to Kim Jong Un, putting economic incentives in the balance, uh, trying to dangle something in front of the North Korea and say, yeah, if you move, if you evolve in a certain way, we can help you develop your economy. Blah blah. blah. I think that's a good idea. If we are trying to coerce or push the North Korean to have to adopt a specific economic model that we want them to have to adopt, it's not going to work. I mean, in my view, I think if we need to. If we want to move forward on denuclearization and offer economic development guarantee, which I think the North Korean are looking for, we need to hear what they have to say on how they want to develop their economy and how we can find a compromise on that. If we are trying to force something on us, it's never going to work. Yeah, I mean, there are really one thing the North Koreans, in my view, are the most worried about is uh, foreign interference. On the security level, on the economic level, they don't want to be a some kind of client state of China. I mean, they are, but they don't want to develop more in this way. No. They, don't to, they don't want to have Washington or Europe or any other country forcing any kind of economic engagement pattern on us. They want to choose how they will develop their economy, how they want to uh, build up their security environment, etc. It's not always, uh, it's, most of the time it's very delusional because they tend to think, okay, we're going to force the US to invest in a, uh, in the IT sector, in the DPRK, and that's how we're going to become rich and we're going to become the new Singapore. Because that's that's their model. When you talk to um, zone managers in the DPRK, they don't want to become Shenzhen. They don't want to be uh, to have the Chinese invest in uh, factories. They want to become not even Hong Kong. They want to become Singapore. They want to be richer than China. They don't want to compete with China. They don't want to follow China. They want to be richer than China, which is delusional most of the time, but that's something we need to that, that's something we need to have in mind also. I mean, we cannot pressure them to become Shenzhen or any failed special economic zone in the, in, in the PRC. Thank you. We have plenty of time for a very interesting uh, uh, discussion. So I'll turn things over now uh, to take your questions if anyone has any. Yes, we'll go with Kent. Yeah, um, oh, just wait. sorry, wait for the mic. Yeah, um, I was wondering um, if you could talk more about Russia and how Russia might be developing in these SEC areas. I know a few years ago there was more talk, especially in, in Rajin, of more cooperation. Um, has there been anything recent that's just been under the radar that you know about? Uh, if you look at uh, official data, which only depicts a very partial picture of the what's going on at the economic level in the DPRK. China, uh, the, Russia is the biggest investor in the DPRK. They have invested in, in the Rising Sun Bank, they invested in several very small scale projects, but also in a, in a large uh, 50 kilometer uh, railway from uh, Hassan, so the, the town at the border of the DPRK and Russia, to uh, the port of Rajin, where they invested in a, in a pier at the port. I mean, the thing is that the, the port of Rajin Sun Bank, so, uh, yeah, sorry. The port of Rajin Sonbong is the only port uh, on the on this side of the of Asia that doesn't freeze year round. So it's it's a major strategic asset for the for the Russian if they're able to refurbish properly the port. Currently, with the with the sanction, it's very hard. But uh, until 2017, if I'm not mistaken, Russia did um, mitigate uh, UNSC resolutions in order to allow. Uh, transport of coal uh, from Russia uh, through Rajin Sonbong to different countries because they actually need the port. Uh, Putin has made very ambitious calls for developing the DPRK and investing a lot in uh, in in, uh, in in especially in transportation because you know, that's your dream of the, an iron silk road linking. Uh, European Russia to, to South Korea, but nothing has happened. I mean, not until, uh, not further, uh, not beyond uh, Rajin Sonbong. There is the, f the former uh, minister, I think it's Mr. Mr. Garushka, but I might be mistaken. The former minister of Far East Development has a very strong personal interest in, in trading with the DPRK. They have uh, a joint commission called Joint Technical Commission for Economic and Technical Cooperation, I don't remember the name. And they are pretty active, but so far, 
I haven't seen, I mean, besides what you see in the media, say, uh, North Korea, um, Russian ships smuggling coal, oil in the DPRK, which happen on a daily basis, but in terms of large scale integration project, I don't think anything is happening. Yes. Uh, Steve Winter is an independent consultant. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, just uh, uh, an observation. I'm going to see if what you uh, view it. So, having myself investigated several borders of Asian countries, I mean, it seems to be a fact that there's a lot of smuggling always going on. And I won't say it's only Chinese doing the smuggling, but they're excellent smugglers. And the could, reasons could be tax evasion, could be you know, illegal uh, items, who knows whiskey, who knows what, uh, arms, uh, to human trafficking. So the fact that there is, as you say, uh, this ingrown relationship on the border you're talking about, it could in essentially have nothing to do with the sanctions. It's just something that takes place on a border like that. Okay, and then just one other thing. Uh, when you're talking about the short-sighted uh, uh, Chinese uh, make a quick buck, that was sort of a theme that came throughout there. But, but on the other hand, uh, the Chinese talk about trying to integrate uh, North Korea into their Belt and Road project, and Putin and Xi are talking very seriously about combining the Belt and Road with his Eurasian Economic uh, Union, uh, which would directly impact, which would mean they would be both working together on, on the North Korea issue. So it seems there's a very long-term vision here going along too. I mean, maybe short-term vision of various Chinese businessmen you're talking about, but there's a long-term, it seems to me, a vision of, uh, at least everybody in D.C. says so, of the, of the Chinese government, and that seemed to be missing from the way you were presenting things. Uh, thank you very much. Um, when it comes to sanctions, you're completely right. I mean, there used to be a lot of smuggling at the, at the border even before the sanctions were implemented because of tax evasion and because uh, Liaoning and Jin province in China are the most corrupted province in, in China, which is saying quite a lot, actually. Uh, you have had smugglers for a long time, very small scale, private, uh, so-called businessmen just crossing the border on foot to bring stuff and bring money or food back, but also more organized kind of stuff using different bribes, etc. So, I mean, the smuggling networks used to exist and they just thrive under sanction and they are mutating a lot. On the, the One Belt Problem Initiative, it's actually a very interesting case of uh, Chinese foreign policy. One Belt, One Road is a new branding of uh, Chinese uh, economic engagement patterns that pre-existed uh, the BRI. Uh, if you look at Chinese uh, investment in Pakistan or in most na neighbor uh, neighbor neighboring countries of China, it's basically led by uh, large-scale state-owned companies f uh, backed by Chinese loans, uh, Chinese banks, investing heavily in uh, invest in infrastructure, infrastructure development. If you take the take the case of Pakistan, 56 billion investment in electricity, roads, blah, blah, blah. If you look at how the Chinese are involved in the DPRK, it's a complete different approach. Small scale, no state involvement, uh, no loans, no financial connection with, uh, I mean, not that we know of, uh, with, the, with the North Korean side. There is a specific, um, I mean, the, the Chinese are very keen on explaining how they, will, they would love to involve the North Korean in the One Belt Round Initiative, and the North Koreans say, Basically, yes, yes, thank you very much. But in, uh, in, in private, they say, we don't want to be involved in any scheme. We want to develop in our own scheme, which does not necessarily fit with the way the Chinese engage with us. And I think the North Korean would be very happy to have China building uh, roads, uh, power plants, that kind of stuff. But the thing is that they are not going to pay for it. That's that's the motto of the of the North Koreans. If you want to develop, uh, if you want to to invest and make money in our country, you can. But we're not going to pay for infrastructure development that you're going to use. We've seen I've seen a lot of uh, call for investments uh, emitted by uh, economic research bureaus within the DPRK for power plants, for roads, for sewer, uh, sewage uh, network systems, and. When they say uh, you, we can we can fund this, uh, we can we would like to, to fund this investment. It's more most of the time through barter trade. If you invest in the sewage station of this town, you will be able to uh, exploit this coal deposit for 50 years, that kind of stuff. But they are never going to give hard currency for that. 
And the reason is not necessarily that they don't have the money, because for some projects they would have the money. It's just that if uh, Chinese are investing and making money in their country, in, in the DPRK, that means that they are, um, they, not, they are not going to pay for the Chinese to make uh, business in their country, if you see what I mean. Yeah, my name is Jin Zheng <coughs> from uh, Howard University. And then I have a, a question about the method of payments and the bank in uh, North Korea. So specifically, Kaesung Industrial Complex, Korean companies paid cash in US dollars. And then in other SEZ, foreign companies paying their local currency like a Chinese yuan to them or US dollar or what is the method of payment? And the number two is uh, Chinese, I mean, uh, North Korean employees, do they save money? Do they have a bank? Do they have a monetary system? That was my question. Uh, for the method of payment, I mean, to pay people, you need to have some, at least some economic activity. I mean, for, uh, the thing is that in most North Korean special economic zones, there is basically nothing happening. There is one case, uh, I mean, they are too young, and um, given the sanctions and given the very difficult business environment of the DPRK, and there's, it's not the right time. In Rajin Sonbong, there is some limited business activity because Rajin has a very strategic position for, for Chinese companies. And if you go to Rason, you will be asked to pay in dollars, you will be asked to pay in yuan, mostly. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's very in even within the country. I mean, I've been spending a little bit of a little bit of, a little bit of time in Pyongyang. You, we have access to um, to North Korean won, but you can easily pay with yuan and with euros actually, and with dollars or with everything. They are really looking for for hard currency. As for the second question that on banking system in the DPRK, well, I'm actually part of a research project. There are some Chinese banks involved in the DPRK right now. Uh, it's a bit difficult to keep track of exactly what's happening. That's There is a lot of uh, cash transfers between China and the DPRK, but also between the DPRK and Russia that are happening. We regularly seen reports about uh, North Koreans uh, caught at the customs with uh, a suitcase full of cash. Uh, we also see that there are some branches of uh, Chinese banks that are active in the DPRK that we have a report of, but it's very hard to know if there is just an, an open office or if there is actually something going on. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll be happy to, to continue the, the conversation with you in a different setting. Uh, Nicholas Hamasevich, PhD candidate at Catholic University. For South Korea, um, obviously there's a lot of talk about Kumgan and Kaesong and DMZ, but there are a lot of political risks and ramifications for trying these areas again. Are there any other places or projects that the South Korean government should be thinking about, or are these the best options for them? Well, there's been there has been one project that's been uh, bounced around in South Korea for a long time. Actually, it's a uh, special economic zone in Heju. So that would be somewhere here. Yeah. I think it uh, during the second uh, North South Summit in 2007, uh, people have been talking about opening a special economic zone in Heju uh, that was supposed to deal with uh, logistics, trade. I mean, it's very near the fishing port activities, that kind of stuff. Uh, I've heard rumors from South Korean scholars that there would be another special economic zone just at the border of uh, Kangwon province, uh, just near Mount uh, Lake Samil, etc., focused on tourism mostly. It's much harder, I mean, it's, I think there is a, I'm definitely not an expert on South Korea, but there is some kind of consensus on the positive impact of Kaesong. On Mount Kumgum, it's much more difficult because of the tragic death of, uh, I mean, she was shot by a North Korean guard. So obviously, uh, if uh, the South Korean government is trying to move on with, uh, with Mount Kumgum, it's going to be much harder. And there is a strong uh, taboo and stigma on this. So the North Koreans will have to make some gesture in terms of security guarantees for, for tourists going there.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zhou Yun from U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, I found your discussion on you know, this topic very interesting because it does throw a light on what the North Koreans or Kim Jong-un wants to do with special economic zones. And I think they do play a key part, at least in their vision. You talked about what the model they're following is. And of course, if you ask North Koreans, do you want to be China? They're going to say no. Do you want to be Japan? They're going to say no. Any country, they're going to say no. But I think their goal is really, with special economic zone, is how to have a development, developing economy that does not really infect other areas. So isolated developments, and many of them. So presumably, if they had it their way, they would have like 100 Kaesong industrial complexes, you know, where you can control exactly what goes in, and can, you can control what comes out. But I don't know whether that's sustainable, and that will take time. So my question to you is, is this model of development where you have complete or you know as much isolation as possible so to guarantee regime security to guarantee there is no uh, infection to overall population I mean is that really possible because at the same time they have a short-term problem and they're trying to do that deal with that through more, I guess, marketization. So how do these go hand in hand, do you think? Or is it, is it can they ever be compatible? Is it on? Yep. Well, thank you very much for your question. It's a, it's a no, no, actually. Um, if you look at, uh, I agree with you because most of North Korean special economic zones are located in very either at the Chinese border or near ports in uh, what I would call enclaves. If you look at, uh, there is a, a well-known pattern of special economic zone in the DPRK that is to open uh, some flat desert pieces of land on the Chinese side of the of the border river. So that, for example, that's a special economic zone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, it's remote, it's separated from the, the rest of the territory, so basically it prevents from ideological contamination, as they, as they say in, in the DPRK. But at the same time, in North Korean law, there is a, a distinction between provincial level special economic zone, what you see uh, with uh, round circles here, and uh, what they call uh, central level special economic zone, what you see in squares. I think what uh, it's very hard to have North Koreans elaborating on the distinction between provincial and central level, but central level tend to be more embedded in the North Korean economy. That's there is definitely a security issue here. That was definitely a case, uh, the case in China. I mean, opening special economic zone in China was very, very far from Beijing at the border with Hong Kong. So in order to engage with Hong Kong, but also in order to limit uh, information flows, people I've heard some people in the DPRK have been a bit skeptical about special economic zone in terms of the risk and the, some kind of snowball effect. If we let province, um, people at the provincial or the municipal level engage freely with uh, foreigners, is it going to change the mindset, their mindset? Are they, how are they going to behave in terms of loyalty towards the DPRK government? It's, are, it's really ambiguous and they are clearly trying to find some compromise in order to let uh, how do they call it? In, Ch in, the Ch in, in Chinese, they, uh, they have a term for um, a mosquito net effect. Let the breathe in, but uh, keep the mosquitoes out. And that's what they are trying to do. It, it failed. In China, it failed. That's what I can say. If, but at the same time, they are, not, they, have, they are drawing inspiration from the Chinese model, but they don't want to copy China. So they might never go as far as the Chinese did in order to actually prevent um, security breach, <laughs> to put it this way. But, Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so my question to you is that what do you think the Korean, South Korean government should uh, 
should do in terms of policy uh, to engage those special zones? And what do you think, what industry um, could could grow in that in that zone? So what Korean companies should should so let's say what Korean um, Korean companies should should um, should do to to those special zones uh, to make profit? Well, the simple answer would be to duplicate the the experience in Kaesong. So basically having a chebol, basically developing the zone, building infrastructure, uh, supplying power, uh, organizing uh, production, but uh, renting actually uh, empty space or factories to small and medium uh, enterprises who are able to actually run at the not at the macro at the at the micro level uh, companies and actually make profits and textile factories in case some were in, immensely successful we had cases of um uh, i don't know what to call it ele um, uh, electronic appliances uh pro production companies were very active in uh in case some. that would be something that could work in the short term but i think that if there is an actual long-term strategy and sustainable engagement economic engage, engagement strategy towards the APRK, the North Koreans are definitely going to want to have higher value added uh, investments and that's definitely going to be to be an issue to be discussed with the North Koreans because when you hear about what they want they just want the best they want I mean Unjong when you talk about the Unjong special economic zone in the DPRK people call it the Pyongyang Silicon Valley that's I mean, people sometimes, my students at Proust don't didn't even know the, the term Unjong. I mentioned, so I showed them on the on a on a Google Earth map and say, oh yeah, Unjong. I mean you it's near Pyongyang actually. They oh we call it the, the Silicon Valley, and that's what they want. It's going it's going to take a lot of negotiating to explain that that's not going to happen and that we need to find some kind of compromise. But also at the, if we want it to be sustainable and not to get the North Korean too frustrated or feel in too inferior, we need to find some middle ground. Am I, sorry, am I answering your, your question? No, uh, yeah, okay. <coughs> Hello, hi, my name is Ae Hyung Kim. I retired from the World Bank. Okay. I'm a typical economist, but I'm interested in you mentioned about colonization of the North Korea by Chinese. But I mean, at least based on your talk, seems like there is no central economic strategy. Yeah. What would be reason? Is it because Chinese that they are very, you know, entrepreneur, yeah. so to select the individuals so they can exploit whatever North Korea can offer. Also, given the circumstance of the sanctions, right? And what would be, I mean, based on the, your conclusion, seems like uh, there, there is uh, no cooperation between South Korean government and Chinese government. So it seems like more realistically is more competition, right? So what South Korea, what kind of leverage or flexibility South Korea government has at the moment or in forcible future, let's say next one year? I mean, as you say, the, we don't know much about the US government strategy. It changes uh, from time to time, right? Basically. Yeah from day to day. So what South Korea government, Korea government can, can actually realistically implement? Thank you. Well, I'm actually going to Seoul uh, next week. So um, I've given this some thought. Um, I'm definitely pro-engagement. So I think if Seoul wants to uh, engage economically with the North, I think they should, because I think it would definitely appease tension, at least in the short term. Um, the thing is that the China DPRK ties, especially on the economic side, are so strained and difficult right now that I think South Korea has a card to play. Coming say, okay, we're not the Chinese. We're not going to 
we're not looking to take over. We're trying to uh, find something that's actually win-win. We're trying to um, adapt, not um, abide by your rules, but at least find some compromise where we can make money, we can stabilize the, secu the, the situation, and, uh, and we can uh, actually contribute to a more indigenous autonomous pattern of growth in the DPRK. And I think the, the, in the current context, the North Koreans would be happy to hear that from the, from the South. They will be skeptical. They will be, there's going to be cheating. There's going to be circumvention of sanctions, of rules, etc. But I think for the time being, that's, that could work. In a more long-term strategy, the Chinese, if South Korea engaged with the North this way, the Chinese are going to find some counter-attack. And that's how that's going to be more difficult because everyone's going to try to offer the DPRK more. I mean, not everyone, but China and South Korea are going to try to offer the DPRK more uh, advantageous uh, investment conditions. And that could leave the DPRK for uh, a lot of leverage in terms of uh, manipulation and playing the DPR, uh, South Korea and China against each other. And that's, I think, it's a negative pattern. So there must be some, at least some coordination to some degree in order to, okay, what are the, what are North Korean trying to do? Are they trying to play uh, South Korea against China? And should we, should we keep on doing this? On the issue of colonization, I don't support the view that China is colonizing the DPRK. I think it's too strong, but that's something I've heard uh, from the, from the North Koreans, not necessarily in the way that we are a colony of the DPRK of China, because they would never uh, say something like that, but that the Chinese are trying to, uh, to colonize the country. Um, investment, uh, trade rather than investments, uh, economic cooperation that basically leaves the DPRK with limited ability to develop in a more autonomous way you know, the gives it limited ability to influence or uh, to uh, steer its uh, economic development strategy. I think that's the most frustrating for the North Koreans. And I think that if we engage with them, we need to find at least some way to, uh, for them to engage with the, the international community at the economic level, but also to uh, give them some leeway in terms of how they want to drive their future developments. Because if we are trying to force something on them, it's not going to work. Well, I mean, you've been working to the World Bank, so I guess you've heard that from African countries, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I, yeah. I don't believe in 50 years. But how that affects in the long term economic development? Because it is raw material, right? Yeah. They are exploiting basically at, at the probably low market price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does it mean? It, I mean, I understand that your colonization may be too strong, but it creates dependence, economic yeah, dependence. Yeah, clearly. Clearly. I mean, it's a pattern of. Uh, the DBRK being stuck as a low value added uh, natural resource supplier to China. And uh, there is also, uh, I mean, when the North Koreans talk about cultural, uh, I mean, when they talk about colonization, there is also maybe a cultural aspect. Like when you talk to Chinese people that are being active, businessmen at the border or even officials, uh, there is a lot of frustration between the DPRK and China, and you tend to have people on the Chinese side of the border looking down on the DPRK as some kind of backwards, like, you know, uh, I don't want to use strong terms, but very backwards little brother that someday somehow is going to wake up and just uh, follow the Chinese model because that's the only way forward. And that's really, really, really frustrating from the, from the North Korean side. Hi, this is Matthew from the Wilson Center. So I'm really confused. So like if North Korea doesn't want like Chinese model when it comes to economic reform, nor does nor doesn't want uh does not want the Western model when it comes to economic reform, that then what model does North Korea want uh when it reforms? Because you have to follow one another, right? The North Koreans no. I 
I don't know what they want, but uh, they, what, would, what they would say would we want to develop our own, or our own way. Does, I'm not saying it's, it's um, very clear and very reasonable attitude, but that's the kind of answer that you would get. We are not following any model. We are doing the way we want. We are dealing with a bad situation that we, we are very isolated. We are the last standing socialist country. But the thing is that even uh, before uh, the end of the Cold War, during the Cold War, the DPRK was already a kind of unique economic development model within the, within the, the Soviet bloc. I mean, if you look at uh, trade, pat trade patterns within the Soviet bloc, the DPRK has always been a very, very, very low, um, uh, has very low uh, level of trade, I, I was very keen on trying to uh, prevent the USSR and China to uh, push uh, economic cooperation model that would seen that would be seen as detrim detrimental from their point of view i don't think this mindset have changed they used to uh, they used to use uh, strate their strategic value and geopolitical capital to force the ussr and china to give them uh, to provide them goods and services at very friendly prices i think they are just trying to use the same patterns but with adapting their economy in order to deal with the fact that they are not trading with state partners anymore, but with private partners from China or from South Korea. And that requires at least some economic reform. I don't think the world, the world pattern, and especially not the world worldview of North Korean economic planners has changed, actually. I started my PhD with uh, looking at um, what I would get in terms of economic doctrine from uh, North Korean uh, writers, and especially Kim Il-sung. And if I compare uh, text that are, or interviews with North Korean scholars with what I was able to find for the 60s, 70s, nothing has changed much, but they do want some reform in, in order to adapt to a changing world. But they don't want to change their core principle. I mean, Juche, basically. Hello, hi. Dokken from Radio Free Asia. And uh, uh, considering the type of or the size of the benefit that North Korean regime can obtain from uh, reopening KIC, and while comparing that to other economic projects that's being planned internally in North Korea, uh, how, would you, how would you assess the significance of reopening Kaesong Industrial Complex um, at this point, perceived by North Korea and from the perspective of North Korean regime at this point? Um, in terms of... Uh financial value. I mean, Kaesong was definitely the most successful venture in the DPRK, uh, not only special economic zone, but even maybe all times, I guess. I mean, in terms of large scale economic integration project in the DPRK, I don't find any example that would be more significant than Kaesong. It would be also a very strong uh, symbolic value, but we also, I mean, we tend to see Kaesong in a kind of rosy picture now because the because it was suspended and because the, the ties now are a bit strained, but we need to also we also need to remember that even when Kaesong was open, the North Koreans have been using Kaesong in order to pressure into getting higher wages, into higher, getting more compromises in concessions. So if we reopen, if uh, Kaesong is being reopened, there's going to be some some bargaining, and the North Koreans are not they are going to see that as a financial opportunity, but also as a political leverage, and we need to know that. I mean. But I mean, yeah, from the North Korean point of view, that would be a, a major, a major in, influx of foreign currency and technology and know-how and power supply and everything. Okay, thank you. Last question. Hi. Um, how are rule of law and legal disputes handled in special economic zones? Um, significant business development requires reliable rule of law. Yeah. So how is that to be addressed? Um, well, the legal corpus, I'm not a lawyer, but the legal corpus dealing with special economic zone is being developed quite extensively. We're still talking about uh, North Korean law. So even if you have, it's not the case, but if, even if we had very solid law in terms of, uh, in terms of, um, investment, trade, and economic-related laws. The thing is that it's very hard to know if it's going to be implemented, if there is actual legal security for investors. I've had discussion with uh, lawyers, Western lawyers and Chinese lawyers that were positioned in Pyongyang for years. And they told me uh, that when it comes to uh, dispute uh, litigation, that kind of procedure, the North Koreans tend to be fair. 
but I was surprised. But at the same time, I mean, I mean, these are the people I talk to. I tend to trust them. But the things that they are lawyers and they are looking for clients, so they were not going to say that's not going to be fair. Clearly, there is a lack of legal security in the DPRK, even if there is some flexibility. So if it's a very important project for the North Korean government or for local powers, there might be some way around and finding ways to have projects moving on. There have been many Chinese companies, especially in mining deals, who have been who have felt uh, that were, they were cheated by the North Koreans, that they've lost enormous amount of money and they were not able to uh, go to either Chinese or North Korean courts. The North Koreans know about this, know, know the importance of legal security, and they are trying to send lawyers to, to China, to Vietnam, and to a European country uh, recently, uh, because it's important, but that would require a huge change, not only on at the legal level, but also in terms of mindset, political culture, etc., and the rule of law uh, in the DPRK being obviously what it is. I don't see any progress in the coming years. Well, I, I think we've given you enough uh, enough questions, give you an opportunity uh, to have a little bit of discussion after. We are, we're going to end a little bit early. Uh, but thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking our speaker, Dr. Theo Clement, for his presentation and his comments. <laughs>